what's the coolest kind of story to talk about on your own podcast? Yeah, your own story. Good morning to you. Good Friday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday. If you're into football and or baseball, I also offer Daily Shots of Steelers and Pirates in the same place that you found this. I write a feature for DK Pittsburgh Sports called Friday Insider. Of course, comes out on Fridays. And it includes just a bunch of stuff that I've heard that's either been shared with me or I dug it up somewhere, made some phone calls, whispered something to somebody else. And this probably won't surprise you based on that description, but it is our most popular feature. It's our most read feature pretty much every week. In today's edition of Friday Insider... I dropped the knowledge, and I do mean knowledge, that it's been discussed inside PPG Paints Arena that Evgeny Malkin could move to the wing next season. Now, as I write further, the extent to which it's been discussed, I have no idea. How seriously they're taking it, I have no idea, and I'm not going to claim to know either. But it's been discussed, and as such, It's a big deal. It is. You're talking about someone who's a Hall of Famer, first ballot Hall of Famer, who's going to be told, maybe, to leave the center position for the first time in his career. Now, if if I know the way people follow this team, I know that one of the first thoughts that you're going to have is, well, is he going to want to do that even? Because that's Kind of how we've been conditioned to think about all of Pittsburgh's superstars over the past 40 years going back to Mario. Yeah, but will they want to do that? I think that part would be easy. I think that part would be a simple case of selling Gino on the idea that he'd have fewer defensive responsibilities. He'd have fewer face-offs that he'd need to take. There's less wear and tear just in those elements. From there, I'd remind him that this isn't rod hockey. He doesn't have to just slide up and down the left side of the rink. If he wants to carry the puck through the middle of the ice, he's more than free to do that. That is, by the way, what he wants to do, as you've kind of noticed. He'll carry it through the middle of the ice, and he'd also prefer to arrive a little late onto the scene. That might be problematic for a winger, but, but it's solvable. It's solvable. This episode is brought to you by Bet Online, your number one source for all your summer sports needs this season, from Major League Baseball, golf, NHL, NBA playoffs. Get the latest odds and lines, including all team matchups, player props, odds on just about everything that's out there. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Next thing I tell them is that Mario himself moved to the left wing in the latter stage of his career, as did a lot of Gino's uh, now retired Russian heroes. Uh, Sergei Fedorov, well, Sergei, I was going to say Sergei Fedorov moved to the wing. Sergei moved everywhere. Sergei could play any position on the rink, including a really, really good defense. Not just on the power play either. Sergei could do it all five on five, shorthanded, whatever. So you could throw that his way, too. So I, I do think. That the sell job can happen. I think that this could also be a good thing for the hockey team if, of course, you have another answer at second line center. I don't know that that currently exists, not in the organization. Uh, As much as I love Lars Eller, I don't know that I want him taking that up at age 34. So there's problems and holes that can be created from this, but there are also real positives. And look, I'll remind here a second time, and I'm doing this on purpose, that I don't know how seriously this has been discussed, but the fact that it came up means it came up from somebody somewhere at some stage of something. And if it comes from uh, a positive perspective, like, yeah, we'd really like to see Gino drive the offense more and concentrate more on offense. If it comes from a negative perspective, like, man, 
his giveaways and whatever else are killing us. I'm oversimplifying this at both ends, obviously. If the Penguins have an acquisition in mind, if they have someone who they feel like, yeah, if we got this guy, if we have a target on the back of this particular player in free agency, and we move Gino to the wing, we get better usage out of everybody, including potentially Gino, then that's a way for us to mitigate the old age on this team. You know, by taking one of the guys who's the oldest and moving him to a less important, less potentially damaging role, we can become a better offensive and a better defensive team. So this is where you come in. I, I want to hear from you in the various places that you can comment on this show. That means, of course, on DK Pittsburgh Sports, uh, in the comment section, you can put them under Friday Insider, as some people have already done as I'm recording this. Uh, you can put it underneath the podcast. And of course, I'm always welcoming feedback on the YouTube channel, which of late has been pretty heavy. And not just from the usual annoying Maple Leafs fans. And, and, and by the way, why do Maple Leafs fans listen to this show? I, I don't even get that. Don't you have like your own daily shot of Maple Leafs or 1967 R Us kind of show that you can go to? Why are they always coming here? Don't understand that at all. When we come back, J1Q. Q comes from Erica. She is mad at me, by the way. She's not even a Maple Leafs fan. She says, DK, why don't you stop blaming Kyle Dubas for the bottom six structure that involved two defensive lines, which were actually better defensively than the ones from the previous year. Dubas has his warts, but what kind of lines the Penguins wanted for the bottom six was entirely dictated by Mike Sullivan. And I know you refuse to blame Teflon Mike for anything, but this is a huge one that he should be blamed for. Erica, my understanding of what happened in this regard last summer was that Dubas and Sullivan very much jointly decided that they were going to try to bolster the defensive presence of the team and the uh, what's the, the hard to play against. I, I'm out of hockey season here to be remembering his catchphrases. They wanted to up both of those factors. And I have characterized that call that way ever since, meaning that the GM and the head coach were on the same page with this. I haven't separated either Dubas or what do you call him? Teflon Mike or Teflon Mike from that process. However, when I bring up what I didn't like about the constitution of the bottom six is that with the exception and the significant glowing exception of Lars Eller, these were just swings and misses all over the place. These were bad acquisitions. Now, if you want to blame Sullivan for the individual players, if you want to say, you know, Sullivan should have been scouting you know, Matt Nieto or Noel Achari or whatever, go right ahead and do that. But that also flies in the face of what both of these guys say, which is that Sullivan really doesn't want to get involved in those types of things. He did kind of hope that he could have been involved in some of the messes that Ron Hextall had made. But he's got what appears to be, Sullivan does, a genuine trust in Dubas, and he's just going to leave him to do his thing. So Achari, who Dubas had in Toronto, not an accident, is the main guy that's brought in as one of the wingers, penalty killers, and he was supposed to be your in-your-face, hard-to-play-against. Um, I don't, you know, there were some mentions of Brandon Tanev at the time. I never took those seriously because I'd seen Achari play and I've definitely seen Tanev play and they're not similar. Nieto came with all kinds of positive recommendations, one of which was from Brian Rust. And 
that obviously didn't pan out in large part because of injuries. And from there, a decision was made that they were going to continue riding Jeff Carter. That decision apparently also was a joint one. If they wanted, and it would have been cumbersome from a cap standpoint, but they could have just sat Carter in the press box all year long. They didn't do that. He had a uh, at least one healthy scratch early on that I can recall. It might have been more than one. And at the time, I remember Sullivan you know, getting all emotional and, you know, this is just going to be one of those things. Jeff understands where we are, da 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 Well, I mean, that never needed to happen. And if you've discerned a lot of what I've said on this subject, and it sounds like you have, which is the only reason I'm saying that, over the past year, you'll recall that my biggest issue with this was that they just kept adding 30-year-olds and what was really needed on the third and fourth lines, and I said this last year and I'm saying it again now, is kids, is live legs, is energy, is what you saw the Penguins do late in the regular season when they beat the Hurricanes here in Pittsburgh, and they did it on the strength of these kids. And everyone, all the older guys, I was in the room afterward, were raving about the kids and all the energy that they brought and how they picked us all up and everything. That was needed all along. That was needed all along. Not Achari, not Nieto, certainly not Carter. You know, and while I'm at it, not Riley Smith either. It's just a big, big mess was made out of it, and most of it is on the GM. I appreciate the question. I appreciate the admonition because it means you're listening. I appreciate everybody who listens to Daily Shot of Penguins. We will do another one of these on Monday.